Good morning. My name is Paul Irving. I'm the president of the Milken Institute, and I want to formally welcome all of you to Global Conference 213, our 16th. Uh, you're going to have, I think, a fantastic three days. We have 140 panels, a great opportunity for learning and relationship development and change. And I'm particularly pleased this morning to uh, be here because I have the opportunity to introduce our founder and chairman of the Milken Institute, who's going to lead this panel, our first on bioscience, Mike Milken. Thank you very much, Paul, and I am very happy to be with you. This is the first of 20 sessions related to science at the Global Conference today, and why are we so focused on science and why are we so focused on bioscience? First, it's accountable for more than 50% of all the economic growth in the world. It has been the foundation of probably the greatest achievement we've ever had, and, and that is the extension of life and the fact that in a century we've doubled life expectancy on this planet. All of us, for when we were very young, used to see these science fiction movies and stories where things have become a reality today. So what was once science fiction today is in commonplace, and therefore, how did it happen? It did not happen by accident. It happened by a commitment to the sciences. And today we have really uh, a great group of scientists. I'm calling majority leader Eric Kanner a scientist for his support in, in these areas here today. I'm curious as to what that science is. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to start with a call to action, that wake up call. In 1957, we had that wake-up call. Sputnik went up. It was a call to America that we had not been on the forefront of science. It was a period of time of great fear in America. And the world was changed by this activity that occurred in 1957. DARPA was formed that we're going to hear about today. NASA was formed. The country did everything it could to encourage people to go into what we would call STEM education today. Being in math and science and physics was cool. It changed the world for so many people and for many people on this panel. Paul Chu had changed your world in many ways. Today, Paul is the head of global medical affairs for Sanofi, an international pharmaceutical company. But Paul, how did you get interested in science? Well, you know, um, Mike, first of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing us to, to participate in this great, this great conference. I, uh, first of all, I, I was only a few years old when I heard the beep, beep, beep on the television. Of course, I didn't know what that meant at that time. I was four or five years old. But the next time I saw this was a, a summer science program, which I'm sure is not offered anymore, it was a national defense summer program, which I thought sounded rather ominous for a high school student. Uh, but it provided uh, about 50 kids from all over the country scientific exposure. I did it for two years. One was at MIT uh, and um, the Harvard hospitals on neuroscience. This was in the late 60s. And another was a summer at Berkeley, which was very exciting because I was thinking of going there. But there it was on uh, mathematics and um, number theory. Uh, and the National Defense Fund, I later found out, was in response to the uh, need, a call for action for science in this country. So the country was really organizing and building up the scientific literacy of the next generation. That is something I think we need to reinvigorate in this country as we now are facing, in the 21st centuries, more challenges. Not only human health, but uh, global warming, uh, wind farms, nanotechnology, a lot of this requires an informed and supportive uh, uh, public, and that's what I would ask uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Mr. Cantor to consider as we go through the sequestration, we don't want to sequester our future. And our future is through an informed and participating public. I think when we step back, for me, when Sputnik went up, I was a little older than Paul. I was in fifth grade. <laughs> and my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Freeman, taught us how to do these duck and cover drills. <laughs> and it began a sequence that has followed me through my whole life, asking questions of things that didn't make any sense. I mentioned to my teacher, I didn't understand that if a nuclear bomb hit <laughs> Hesby Street Elementary School, why I would be safe under my desk. <laughs> and I, and uh. That discussion went on for quite a while. Eventually, we reached a compromise. She would not try to convince me, and I would not disrupt the class. But <laughs> it did change the world substantially. And one of the things that's changed the world substantially for all of us is DARPA. And luckily, the deputy director of DARPA is here today. Jeff, tell us a little about your path into science, and tell us a little about what DARPA does and maybe give us a couple examples of what you're working on today. Thank you very much, Mike, for allowing me to be here. Uh, I want to uh, clarify that I'm not the deputy director of DARPA. I'm the deputy director of the Defense Sciences Office at DARPA. There puts me a few rungs down. But in, in any event... Um, you probably didn't read about your promotion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say that uh, the uh, path to DARPA was a... Um, was an interesting one. It was uh, one that uh, began simply because I was interested in the sciences, much like everybody in the room here is and many of the audience. And following one's own passions on what you want to do with your life is, is always a, a good thing. So, uh, and then uh, while I was in the Army, I'd been in the Army for 21 years, the Army and uh, DARPA kind of felt that it was a good place for me to come. And so I went there uh, eight years after I returned back from Afghanistan for my first tour. And uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity. And that's exactly what DARPA provides, is opportunity. DARPA is a child of Sputnik. There's no question about it. When Sputnik went up, uh, the uh, world was, uh, the country was in a tither, wondering how the Russians technologically got ahead of the United States. And it was under President Eisenhower's administration at that time that they felt that one of the things that happened was that the uh, military industrial complex, is what President Eisenhower called it, became too, um, too staid in the, their approaches, too conservative. And so they decided to form a small agency, a DARPA, uh, within the Department of Defense with a sole mission, and it was a very simple mission, and that is to um, conduct research to maintain the technological superiority of the United States. A very simple mission that has very profound implications. And over the years, DARPA has done exactly that. We've, um, we've pursued research that one would say is a little far out, a little, um, you know, revolutionary, and even some people will say just downright crazy. But it has given rise. Uh, the record of achievement speaks for itself. The Saturn V rocket, which I believe Dr. Bernard actually rode, <laughs> Dr. Harris rode. <laughs> the, uh, Not quite that old. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, but the Saturn V rocket was enabling, right? I mean, it was enabling. How did you reach extraterrestrial orbit? How did you go to the moon? You needed a lift vehicle, and DARPA provided it. Um, how about getting uh, communications from uh, one uh, military scientist to a civilian academic scientist, well, they created the internet, or back in those days, it was called the ARPANET, and on and on this goes. And so this is really the idea of DARPA, which is a little unusual, is that these ideas come from within DARPA. We are a small agency, I believe that we should remain a small agency, and we are very focused on research that has a particular goal. And the ideas come from the DARPA program managers themselves, and then they work in very close collaboration with other government scientists, government agencies, as well as academia and, of course, industry. And from that grows many, many things. So it's a, it's a model that works, and I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a model that, within its constraints, I should say, it works. It shouldn't, when you want to do exploratory work, uh, you want to go and discover things that are undiscoverable, um, things like the NIH, National Science Foundation, those are wonderful places to go but to guide research to a place where there is a specific task at hand. If you want to achieve something, then DARPA is a great place. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Now, after Sputnik went up, I decided it was time for me to apply to run the space program, Bernard. I don't know if you knew that. I was 11 years old. I wrote a letter to the president letting him know that I was ready to serve to lead our space program. And 
I gave him my qualifications. I had never missed a problem in math and science in my <laughs> entire life, and I'd been reading comic books since I was six and fully understood space travel. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I never received a response uh, to that, Bernardo. We might have met each other a long time ago. Your interest in science, your interest in math, obviously, as an astronaut for 19 years, not too many people in our audience, even though you can do it commercially now, have had a chance to go to space. Um, what sets you off on your path? Well, you know, it sounds very similar to, you know, the other folks here uh, today. Uh, watching Sputnik, I was really young during that time. But in 1969, I was 13 years old, and watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon, and I remember watching that on that little black and white television and saying, I want to do that. And I was no different than any other, I, I think, uh, American kid at the time, like yourself, and also uh, any kid of the world. You know, we all wanted to follow in those astronauts' footsteps, and um, so that's how, it, that's how it started. I, I then, uh, toward high school, had to figure out what I would major in. Uh, since you couldn't go to college to major in astronautics, or, or to be an astronaut, I should say. And so I decided to go into medicine, in part because of a mentor that I saw, and this is really kind of important uh, when I talk to young folks about, uh, even, even mentors from afar can make a difference. And Joe Cohen was the first American physician to travel on board Skylab. And so I saw him, and I decided that I would follow in his footsteps. Uh, he was a flight surgeon who later uh, joined NASA and he flew for 28 days on Skylab. And so I had that whole um, notion, that dream, it was just kind of played out and, and I, you know, followed right behind him. And as a result, uh, you know, I've had a chance to fly on a couple of missions on board Columbia and Discovery and travel around 7.2 million miles. And before you ask, no frequent flyer mileage or anything related to that. <laughs> But uh, just an incredible um, experience to uh, that science, what we're talking about today, allowed me to do. And that love for science allowed me to do. So, you know, when I look at the topic for today, I'm looking at it from, from two standpoints. One is that <laughs> the only way that we can ensure uh, bioscience advancements is to ensure that we have people who are innovative and, and uh, that bring about new technology to bring these things to, to bear. And uh, the other thing is those people that we are uh, trying to get engaged in science, we have to start as early as possible. So technology is key, making sure you have the environment to move innovation forward, and then also have this knowledgeable workforce, as I call it, that's able to bring that, those innovations forward. I think when we think about science and We've talked a little bit about medicine here on the panel already, or medical science. We, it's really important, something that Paul has pointed out, that we emphasize that bioscience is going to address energy, environment, food, agriculture. Uh, in this period of time, unfortunately, we'll have to deal with bioterrorism and other issues. So we aren't just talking about health and, and issues. We're talking essentially about the future. Many years ago, I was a tester in Disneyland for Polaroid for their new instant motion picture. And I had something that weighed like 20 pounds with a big thing hanging out. And I was walking around Disneyland and I looked over there and someone had this little machine that was recording. I walked over and um, it, was, it was the beginning of what we think of as these you know, cameras, our moving cameras today recorders. It was about one-tenth of the size, one-eighth of the weight, and it recorded for 30 minutes versus two and a half. And I had to notify the people I was working for at Polaroid as a tester that their product was obsolete before <laughs> it was released. And I think this is the challenge we have in science. Um, and with us today on the panel, we have two individuals with awesome responsibility in, in this area. Commissioner Hanberg from the FDA and Majority Leader Eric Cantor. And last September, we held the celebration of science, a wake-up call 
for America to recommit itself to an investment in the sciences at that time. And Dr. Hamburg was an active participant in that effort. Dr. Hamburg, how did you get interested in science? What? And uh, let's start there. I have a, a somewhat different story than some of the others. I grew up surrounded by science. Um, I was what was fondly known as a, a faculty brat on the Stanford campus. My parents were both uh, professors uh, at the medical school at Stanford. And basically, the parents of everyone I knew uh, were uh, scientists in one way or another, uh, certainly um, academics with strong interests in, in discovery of one kind or another. So, um, so I, that was rather different, um, and it grew up, you know, really exposing me to the excitement of careers in science um, and the fulfillment that came with it. And I planned to have a career in academic medicine. I sort of thought either you were a doctor or you were a garbage man, basically, in terms of you know, career paths. And briefly in college, I thought about doing something <coughs> else. And my father now refers to that as the period when I was drifting. But, um, uh, but for me, you know, the, the critical juncture was not um, the exposure to science. And I frankly never had a desire to be an astronaut. But what really changed my career path was as I studied medicine um, and began to be deeply exposed, this new disease that nobody knew what it was, what caused it, or even what to call it was starting to emerge, a immune suppression syndrome in formerly uh, healthy individuals. And um, it later was identified as HIV AIDS. And as a medical resident in New York City, we had nothing to treat this terrible disease with, um, supportive care at best. Um, and it was creating huge social, legal, um, economic, ethical, political issues. And I really started then to focus on the critical intersection of science and society. And really, that was when I shifted my career, decided to go down to Washington to learn about the world of health policy and sort of found myself um, uh, enmeshed ever since. Um, but, but, you know, this, this, the importance of, of linking science and discovery um, with broader issues in society today uh, to address a critical public health problem is so exemplified by AIDS. And I had the great fortune in the course of my career to, to watch discoveries coming out of NIH um, and elsewhere uh, translate into treatments that are making a meaningful difference in the lives of individuals with HIV infection. And the panel following this one today will get a chance to see some of the work of Dr. Hamburg and others in a very outgoing uh, Magic Johnson and David Ho, who's de devoted a great deal of his life to working on AIDS 22 years after Magic Johnson announced he had HIV AIDS is as vibrant as he's ever been, and testimony to science. The celebration of science I, I spoke about, uh, really the goal was to reaffirm many objectives. One, the enormous benefit and in the investment that the United States government, the federal government, had made in biosciences uh, since 1998, an incremental $200 billion between the National Science Foundation, between the National Institutes of Health, increases in some of the other agencies, and that we are at the forefront, the forefront of the opportunity today since work that Dr. Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, who's sitting in the front row with us here today, did in sequencing the human genome, 13 years and more than $3 billion. Now is a couple hours and $1,000 Precision medicine is on our doorstep. The return on this enormous investment is right here today. And what role will the United States play in the future? One of the most important areas of this was this is a bipartisan effort. This isn't a Republican or Democratic issue. What role the United States is going to play in the world is going to be determined 
for the next six to 12 months as we decide what we're going to fund. China has already announced its five-year $308 billion program in the biosciences, which already is more than 50% larger than the United States. And with this challenge, Majority Leader uh, Cantor and others joined us as we look at the increases, 20% increases per year in India, China, significant increases in Brazil, Korea, Japan, Germany, and the UK uh, in the investment in bioscience and significant decreases, particularly here in the United States. This was our call to action and Majority Leader Cantor and Majority Leader in the Senate, Harry Reid, did find some commonality of ground in helping to pass and the President signing the National Center for Advancing Translational Research. Majority Leader Cantor, we obviously have a great deal of challenges in our country. How are we going to energize our government to support our future in science? Well, Mike, first of all, <clears throat> thanks for being such a leader for science, uh, because I think the Milken Institute has played a phenomenal role um, at beginning to bring the different sides together in Washington uh, to find common ground on science. And as you know, the common ground effort in Washington has not been so successful lately. Uh, and so I, I really applaud the Milken Institute for what you're doing. And it has demonstrated success, which uh, again is for the good of all of us. The, the problems are, uh, continue to mount in Washington. Um, certainly the philosophical divide over the sort of size and scope of government and how we address some of the imbalances at the fiscal level continue to permeate pretty much every discussion that goes on in the Hill. Uh, so again, no shortage uh, of that. But <clears throat> what that has done is it has caused several years now uh, for the inability to pass a budget. It has then produced what we all know in Washington parlance as CRs or continuing resolutions. Uh, this is the very nonsensical approach of saying we're going to have the same spending blueprint this year as we did last, reflecting last year's priorities. So you're sort of stuck in ways of allocating dollars. Uh, and on top of that, now aggravated by what is known, Paul said, sequestration. Uh, so which um, has tended to not only lock in the inflexibility, but has now um, applied a very blunt instrument uh, of spending reduction by across the board cuts, uh, frankly because Washington, neither House nor Senate, Republican or Democrat, was able to uh, arrive at with the White House some agreement on how we can be much more qualitative uh, in our spending targets and reductions. So that having been the landscape of the issue on the fiscal side, I do say that we have a bipartisan agreement that science is a good thing. Uh, and uh, I know that the president has come forward with a budget indicating that he believes that and a priority should be placed on that. Uh, as you know, we in the House have continued to say, with all the fiscal stress we're about, investing in science is about the future. And um, you know, it has the potential, when, when the private sector is unwilling to undertake a risk on basic science, we've seen, as you've just pointed out, Francis Collins here uh, as a personification of that success, the return on the federal government's undertaking a risk the private sector won't uh, is limitless, uh, if we do it right. And um, I also think, Mike, that science offers us not only um, a game changer in that respect for the return, but also if you harken back to those problems I just laid out, it could help us fix the fiscal problems. Not only are we about cures and increasing the quality of life for those who are sick, but as we look at healthcare reimbursement and the way that we have to go about financing this healthcare law in the future and the status of affairs, I think that science could be a big, big help, if not the help, in allowing us to overcome the mounting cost. Thank you. I, I think the areas that uh, Majority Leader Cantor has touched on, we all recognize in the health medical area that we have three parts. The prevention wellness sector, 
the treatment care and the cure research area that Sanofi and others are focused on. We all recognize it's impossible to solve the problem in the middle where more than 90% of the expenditures are the care treatment. And much of the work at the Milken Institute over the years is try to focus on the fact that it costs the United States one trillion dollars a year just the change in weight in America in the last 20 plus years. One of the other focuses at the celebration of science was the, for the young scientists, individuals that had spent 15, 16 years going to college, getting their MD, getting PhDs, doing internships, residency, fellowships. And at that event, you might remember uh, Majority Leader Cantor, we sat in, and Commissioner Hamburg, we sat in the first three rows at the Kennedy Center, 100 young scientists. Now the leader in the Senate, Majority Leader in the House, Commissioner of the FDA, um, and others of who were sitting or would have been there were sitting behind them as a message to the importance of science. We sometimes forget over the years what young scientists or how old people were when things were discovered. Einstein was 26 when he published his special theory of relativity. Jonas Salk was 30 when the March of Dimes funded his polio research. James Watson, who was with us on the stage that night, was 25 years old. And Sir Isaac Newton was 23 when he started inventing calculus. A number of people have been very focused. And Madame Curie, who invested radioactivity at 30, had already won two Nobel Prizes by the time she was 45. And Bernard Galileo published his first work at 22. Young scientists, the promise and question of America to encourage people into science. Bernard has taken up that challenge. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Certainly. Um, you know, as an astronaut, I've had an opportunity to go out and speak to many different groups across the nation. And one thing I saw was that there were some issues around education in this country, particularly in the inner city. So in 1998, we created the Harris Foundation, which supports education, health, and wealth programs. Uh, with this premise that in order for an individual or community to uh, be successful and achieve, they need to have those three elements. And so our largest programs are around ed education. And uh, over, you know, since the time of creating the, uh, the summer science camp, we, as you see, we have uh, served over 115,000 uh, students uh, through various programs, crime prevention program. Uh, we run the uh, ExxonMobil Bernard Harris Summer Science Camp, which is the long largest uh, summer science camp uh, in the country. We're in 20 universities nationally. And uh, there we bring in kids, uh, middle school kids, to your point, Mike, starting early. You know, these uh, uh, scientists uh, created uh, new things, discovered new things at an early age. And we believe if we're going to impact uh, the future of this country, we need to start early. So it's a middle school-based program. Uh, we also uh, have uh, other programs around health through partnerships. Again, partnerships are important with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We believe that uh, uh, in order for us to move forward as a country economically, we need to teach kids early on about financial literacy. So we have programs with, with other uh, groups like Capital One and banks and the Federal Reserve. Uh, so I really believe in this, uh, this partnership between uh, corporations, um, governments, and nonprofits to really move, move things forward. And it's the only way that we're going we're gonna to solve this issue. This partnership obviously has been one of the main goals of the Milken Institute, getting into groups to work together. Uh, Bernard just mentioned for-profit companies, Exxon, Capital One, et cetera. Foundations such as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation working with groups such as NASA and the promise. Our challenge, our challenge is that this is the greatest opportunity in the bioscience and history with where we stand. This increased incremental investment of 200 billion by the United States, we stand at the forefront of a complete revolution. 
and immunology and stem cells in orgs and precision medicine, but this is the worst time for a young scientist to get funding. They have the lowest percentage they've had in a generation. So yes, we want them to start that journey. At the end of the journey, that opportunity might be in China, India, and other places in the world, and this is our challenge. A small 5% cut in funding, for example, at the NIH results in an 80% reduction in young scientists. This partnership idea, Paul, could you talk a little bit about large pharma, its partnerships, and what you think we could do to increase our activities, and who you partnership, who you partner with today? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. Well, Safi is a global uh, healthcare company in over 80 countries with over 100,000 employees. It's had a long-standing history around the world, and it's done very well in the emerging markets in recent financial times. But it's critical that, of course, to sustain and have continuous innovation, that we need not only a pipeline of drugs, we need a pipeline of talent. And that talent needs to come from wherever it is in the world for a global healthcare company. Now, in the United States, we have a wonderful ecosystem, uh, social mobility, and the ability to adapt to changing business needs. So obviously, the United States is a place where uh, we can find a lot of talent. But there's talent in Europe, in the emerging markets. And also, the four walls of Sanofi are not, by any means, where all the talented ideas will come from. So we have many partnerships. Some are innovative, such as the uh, Warp Drive Bio Venture, looking for microbial genomics as a possible source of therapeutics. It's a combination of Sanofi investment, venture capital investment, and um, academic investment, so that the risk is shared and there's appropriate structure of benefits. And also, we partner by investing in the communities and countries where we work. Uh, last week, we just announced the, uh, the uh, factory in Morocco, which will manufacture for the continent uh, malarial drugs, anti-malarial drugs. So it's local investment, <coughs> local talent, uh, local economy, local community. All of these benefit. Of course, it's also lower cost because you're closer to the market. Similarly, in India, we've invested in a factory to make a low-cost, reusable uh, insulin pen which may be more uh, affordable uh, in that part of the world. In China, uh, in other parts of the world, we're also investing. So we want to be um, part of the fabric of the, the economies and part of the fabric of the talent that we can access there. Dr. Hamburg, you obviously are regulating maybe 20 to 25 percent of overseeing of the entire consumption in the United States and interacting with more than 100 countries. What partnerships are, have you found to be productive and what might be more, what could we do if we could get increased funding for the FDA? Well, where would that lead to new partnerships? Okay. Well, there are really sort of two aspects of that question that I'd like to try to quickly address. One is the challenge of globalization and both the science that we're seeing um, that underlies the products we regulate and the very products themselves in whole or in part really reflect a global marketplace and global needs and we increasingly are regulating products from as you mentioned it's actually more than 150 countries being made in 300,000 different facilities around the world the number of imports has quadrupled over the last uh, decade so we really need to work in new ways and new partnerships um, with both industry and other nations and counterpart regulatory authorities so we can have a seamless system of, of oversight and protection of the supply chain and assurance of the safety and quality of these products. And it really does mean um, for us stepping out from our historic traditional role as a domestic agency and really having a global presence and that of course brings a whole new model for how we do business as well as, needless to say, additional costs in terms of this global um, presence. But it's absolutely crucial to success and it's absolutely crucial that we think about not just how do we apply our rules, but, but how do we bring new tools 
to the task before us, including, importantly, information sharing um, and new uh, systems applying uh, risk-based um, IT strategies to help us assess uh, risk, and importantly, you know, really looking at how do we measure outcomes and work with, with others in industry and um, regulators around the world to put a focus on preventing problems rather than addressing them after they occur, and that's important whether it's drugs and devices or whether it's food. I also just want to quickly mention, and then maybe we'll come back to it, the importance of the ecosystem for advancing biomedical product innovation and the critical nature of partnership at every level there. It's not just good ideas and science that become uh, products, but it's, it's uh, patent and exclusivity issues, it's economic policy and tax credits, um, it's how we invest in science in the public and the private sector. It's obviously whether we can be a smart and efficient regulator. And then um, Majority Leader Cantor mentioned the important issue of reimbursement and the realities of, of our healthcare system and its costs and how do we make sure that we are producing things that really work, really make a difference and are cost effective. So we all have to work together and it cuts across industry, academia, government, um, and of course, ultimately, um, uh, Congress is a key partner in making sure that we have an integrated system. Could you talk maybe a little bit about partnerships with DARPA and maybe some of the changes with the new regulations with pharma in the last year? Okay. Well, one of the things that we have been learning at the FDA is that um, if we want to be a gateway, not a barrier to progress, we have to engage early. We have to work with the sponsors of innovative new products um, to really define what kinds of information is needed to be able to assess whether this product um, is, is as safe as it can be. Does it really work? Does it provide a clinical benefit um, to patients? And can it really go from an exciting discovery in science into a real world product that will make a difference in people's lives? So in the many different models, we are trying to really enhance this early and continuing engagement. DARPA is a good example. You know, a decade ago, I think, you know, DARPA existed in its zone, FDA existed in its zone, and never the twain would meet. Um, and we really, I don't think, you know, had partnerships or even understood that we had a need for partnerships. But I think that the, the realities of the world and an opening up has, has enabled us to work together in key areas. And when a good idea has been identified, um, to really say, we want to do more than just study this. We want to make sure that it actually becomes a product that matters. And so we've been working with DARPA um, around a number of different projects, but one um, very exciting one having to do with a medical device, uh, an artificial limb, which is so important, especially to deal with some of the traumatic injuries um, that we see in our um, war fighters coming back um, from their tours in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you know, really something that, that has the dramatic potential to change lives and getting it out there earlier by this early um, uh, communication, collaboration, and identification of, of what it will take to take this incredibly exciting scientific and technologic advance uh, into the lives of people. I think with this partnership effort, we are honored today, and, and the Milken Institute has been honored to be able to work with Dr. Andy von Eschenbach, who's with us today, who headed both the National Science Institute and the FDA, and his enormous efforts in creating that partnership between the National Science Institute and the FDA. And Andy, we really appreciate your work in those areas. Uh, when we talk about DARPA, Jeff, maybe you could give us some examples of what Dr. Hamburg has just spoken about here. We are all aware of the tremendous psychological toll as well as physical toll that our troops have had, and you saw it firsthand in your tours of duty. Uh, could you maybe show us and talk a little bit about what's going on at DARPA today? Yes, I am absolutely pleased and honored to do so. The um, DARPA has invested in a number of uh, efforts uh, to create um, enabling technologies, and in particular, medically enabling technologies. Uh, this is born out of a need, uh, clearly. This is clearly, clearly born out of a need, and we don't have to go into detail about that. We all understand that. 
But really what the challenge was from a, was bringing in the community of science. And I, and I, I, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Hamburg and Dr. Chu for bringing in that the broader community is just not the scientists. It is the manufacturers, it is the regulators, it is the reimbursement industry, it is the entire community, the legislators. These are all a community that have to be brought to bear to actually get something to the marketplace, something to the patient. At the end of the day, it is ultimately there's somebody waiting for this at the end of this pipeline. So for us, it had to do with, in this particular example I'm going to share with you, and I have two videos, is uh, the DARPA uh, prosthetic arm. And the prosthetic leg we know is, is quite, quite good. Uh, the VA, for years and years, in their dark, uh, uh, by themselves, have been the, really the major supporters of the development of artificial lower extremities, and that's been very, very successful. The upper extremity was very tough. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, and so on. So this was clearly a DARPA project. And what you're seeing here in the video is actually two gentlemen, both wearing the, uh, the DECA arm. And so our performer, in this case, uh, the DECA Corporation was to develop a robotic arm controlled locally uh, using uh, body powering, a foot switch and the like, and getting as much functionality, that's a key word, functionality that they could get in using existing level uh, robotic technology. And that is a picture of Chuck picking up a grape with this robot arm. He's picking up a grape. And notice how he's able to pick it up, not crush it, lift it up in a very dexterous manner to his mouth, and he's not punching himself in the face, I mean, and just feeding himself. This is Randy picking up a Skittle, an M&M, showing the dexterity of this arm. I want you to see these two arms. They're modular. This is not one arm fits all. This is uh, Randy's wearing one that requires a power shoulder because he lost the entire arm. And Chuck, the other gentleman, lost his arm above the elbow but below the shoulder, so he just, he still has a shoulder, so he only needs the part that's just below. And then if somebody had lost just the hand, the hand is also modular. And this device, from conception, this is very important, from conception to market will be five years. Mm -hmm. Five years. Mm -hmm. So this is not a science fair project. This is a project going directly to, as you can see, patients. And for somebody like Chuck, who with no arms, who opens and closes doors with his feet and has to have his wife help him with personal hygiene, you can imagine what had this uh, prosthetic arm means to him. And this is him picking up one of these uh, water glasses, and you know, these water bottles, you know how flimsy these are, and he's picking it up with a cascade of water, it's not sliding. So there's so much you can do with what we have today but by putting your mind to it. But what was critical? How did we get from zero to five years, you would ask? It was very simple. It was the collaboration that Commissioner Hamburg spoke of. This is a collaboration with the NIH. This is a collaboration with the Veterans Administration, who, by the way, is my very best collaborators because they actually bring money to the table. <laughs> and, and this is our collaboration with our friends in the regulatory uh, agency at the, um, at the FDA. I should have, at the outset, brought in CMS. I did not think of it at the time because you know, I'm, a, I'm a soldier, so I don't think of uh, reimbursement because we don't have that in our medical care system, but we should have. What did we do? When we started the program, Dr. F uh, Collins allowed uh, a number of his um, NIH investigators to come over and help us design our program and help us review the proposals and help us go through the process. Dr. Hamburg actually assigned an FDA officer to our program and so that throughout this process all of the best science was brought to bear, the best robotics was brought to bear, and more critically regulatory issues were brought to bear during the development process, the research process, so that we did not go in series, but we did things in parallel. That's what sped things along. But this is great. I mean, that arm is terrific. It's going to be out. People are going to use it. But that, that is a beginning. I want to show you this next video and show you what a dream is. All right, this is a dream. And this arm, which is uh, developed by the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and the magic is in that hand that you're seeing. That hand has 108 onboard sensors on it. It's fully dexterous with fingers that move and so on and so forth independently. This is Jan. She's quadriplegic. She's like Christopher Reeve. And here she is feeding herself with chocolate and giving us a big DARPA smile. <laughs> um, and the key point here is what's different? That one is controlled purely by her thoughts. She thinks to move that arm, that arm moves. And when Scott Paley, uh, this because this was featured on 60 Minutes, asked Jan, what are you thinking when you move that arm? And she said, what do you think when you move your arm? And he said, all I think is to move my arm. And that's what she said she thought. The key difference here is this is expectations of the patients. 
They would like most to have an arm that they have lost. They want to be like Luke Skywalker. They don't want to be like Captain Hook, <laughs> all right? And so the idea here is can you then go directly into restoring a patient rather than rehabbing a patient? But more to the point, when you look at that video, people say, oh, that's so great. It's like looking at Dr. Harris in space. And I would say it is not. It is not. It is looking at Orville Wright when he flew the Kitty Hawk. That's the beginning. That's not the end. The beautiful thing about that piece of research is it speaks to what science can provide to all of us. What I like best about that when I say that we're watching Orville Wright fly the Kitty Hawk, we stood, all of us stood on 1908, stood on a hill and looked at Orville Wright fly that clunky old machine, and only flew for 14 seconds. Spoman said, ah, piece of junk, you know, only flew for 14 seconds. What is that going to ever do for us? But there'll be a number of people who see the possibility, the possibility. And then in just 10 years later, 10 years, 1918, think of the planes that were flying over the skies of Germany. That was just 10 years later. Think about just 30 years later, 1938. The first jet was already being rolled off the production line in Germany, the jet. And just think 60 years later, and that was Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. But it all began with that little clunky thing in 1908 on that hill. And in 60 years, we did all these great things. And all the things that came from it, I believe that this is an example through collaborations with my friends at the NIH, the NSF, the, uh, the FDA, and hopefully CMS as well, that ultimately what it means is, is what will that become? That's the magic of science. So when we think of the investment today, I think Mike said it so eloquently of what it can become. This, this, this was, uh, was Graham Bell saying to his partner, Mr. So-and-so, I need you to come here. Mr. Graham, I need you to come, whatever his name was. I need you to come here. <laughs> but look what it is today. Look what it is today. I would say this is another limb for all of us. So the point that I wanted to make here was is that this one example really is, shows us what things can become. And what they can become are things that none of us can imagine in 60 years. And that is the beauty of science. And that's why we must, as a nation, we must maintain this incredible effort to sustain what is already there, to just let it nurture and grow. Just don't get in its way. We're not asking for any more. We're just saying don't get in its way. And all the wonderful things that will happen will happen because they are happening. We sometimes forget what Jeff has just reminded us. You know, if those of us who were Star Trek friends many years ago, the ultimate in that show was eventually, as you evolved through millions of years, that it was your mind that could create anything. We also often forget what NASA brought us. Would you mind just taking us back a little bit in time, Dr. Harrison? Let's step back to NASA and just step back and figure out what are some of the benefits we received besides sending you to space. <laughs> that was a great benefit, <laughs> at least for me. Um, you know, when we set out, um, what, 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago, to go to the moon, uh, nobody had done that before. And there were a lot of technologies that came out of just that notion of taking a human being and moving them from planet Earth to another planet, just so happens to circle the Earth, called the moon. And in that, we have made so many uh, advances, you know, in rocketry, Saturn, and then eventually the shuttle. But a lot of technology came from just the requirement of uh, condensing technology into a small form, the micro miniaturization of electronics, for example, that resulted in pacemakers and uh, robotics. And there's a slide, if you could bring up, that uh, starts with the spinoffs. And I just want you to look at a few of the uh, innovations that have come from that early space program. And if we can go to the next slide, what you'll see I've got circled here is just a list of about 25, 30 of the very early uh, technologies that were developed from the space program. And you'll see circled uh, robotic surgery. We just talk, talked about the, the DARPA robot. The first robot was actually developed by a NASA scientist, a NASA engineer, that eventually became the Zeus machine and, and now the Da Vinci machine that's in most of the uh, hospitals these days doing surgery. Uh, imaging, for example, is a perfect example. 
When we went to the moon, we sent up satellites. They imaged the surface of the moon. And then when we went to Mars, we did the same thing. And the imaging technology that was required to image the surface of that planet resulted in the uh, imaging technology that's used in the PET scanners and the CT scanners that are, that are out there. Uh, you'll look at the portable X-ray machines con condensing. So it was really, um, and, and one last thing I'll, I'll talk about you know, there on the right, the programmable pacemaker, which was the, um, the precursor to the defibrillators that are now in use today. And all of this has spawned in, uh, entirely new industries uh, just because of the challenge of getting human beings. Now, one of the things, uh, other hats that I wear is I, I run I'm, a venture I'm capital firm. I'm very excited about I'm going to tell you shirt. about this one. I'm going to tell you about this one. <laughs> so I run a venture capital firm called the Salius Ventures, focused in telemedicine. Telemedicine defined as the intersection of IT, uh, medical devices, and um, uh, telecommunications. And uh, you just showed, uh, Jeff, that the cell phone. Do you remember in the early Star Treks, they were walking around with computers before we had computers? Uh, Uhura walked around with an iPad before we had an iPad. We had a communication device, and I, I love the first smartphone that was a flip phone because I used to play around with that when I was in medical school. I'd flip it up and say, beam me up, Scotty. But if we could go back, to, go back one, I want to show this. So this, is, uh, this technology is allowing us to do things in healthcare that we haven't been able to do before. As a medical doctor, I'm now able to do a virtual house call. I'm now able to use technologies to monitor patients. And I just put two examples here. The company called Sensiotech, which is one of our companies, uh, actually used uh, technology uh, that was invented uh, by the government, government-funded technology, ultra-wideband uh, uh, ultra radar. And essentially what it does is sends a signal into the body, bounces off internal organs, enable to count beats, look for arrhythmias, uh, do blood pressure, and it's just a pad that goes under a hospital bed, so you can do remote monitoring. Uh, and you remember in Star Trek, I put this picture in here to show, when the doctor went to uh, examine a patient, they laid the patient on the bed, and immediately the vital signs would show up. We can do that today. The other example is uh, eCardio, which is an ambulatory cardiac monitor. So now instead of having 12 leads connected to your chest uh, to do a, a halter, you simply can have a, a very uh, three-lead device or a belt that goes around the chest, and you're able to do a conti continuous monitoring. And then if we go to the next slide, just want to talk about where we're headed from the standpoint of, of healthcare. This is a slide that was uh, developed by Dan Wolderman, the CEO of uh, Herman Memorial, and I love this slide because it shows where we are, where we are traditionally, and where we're going, which is something that I, I think we need to, to keep in mind. And uh, I won't go through, through all of this, but we're in this transition in healthcare, and technology is going to be right in the middle of this. Bioscience is going to be in the, in the, right in the middle of this. Uh, when we talk about personalized uh, uh, health care, we talk about uh, what we do with the genomic project. We've got the, the brain uh, initiative that's just being started. Just think about the implications that this is going to have on health care in this country and the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramos. I'm one of our great philosophers, and in many ways maybe one of our greatest in our country, was Benjamin Franklin. And back in 1754, he put out this, what we might call a political cartoon, Majority Leader Cantor, and uh, basically telling the colonies that they would have to join or die. And essentially, we live together or we die separately. Today, at our Faster Cures organization, we have a different one here which shows you many of the parts here that we're trying to get coordinated. One of the themes, and maybe one of the most important themes at the celebration of science, was the fact that the U.S. contribution to bioscience in the world has benefited the world more than the trillions and trillions of dollars of foreign aid over a very long period of time. Whereas we start with this panel today, we end 140 panels later with one focused on Africa. And so Bill Gates and Tony <coughs> Blair and 
President Kwame from Rwanda, leaders from Chevron and other are joining us. And if we say focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa, what has maybe been the largest change? It's been the change in bioscience. The fact that a woman has gone from a 98% probability of passing AIDS onto her children to a 98% possibility of not passing AIDS onto her children if she has AIDS. The sheer fact that <coughs> life expectancy is dramatically increasing. And this is the main driver of those economies. So we start today and we end on the same theme on Friday. And that theme of working together brings us to majority leader Kim. As it relates to U.S. foreign policy and the relationships in the world, the U.S. has been the leader and Europe to date in providing the products and services that have extended the length of life of people throughout the planet. Those set up special. There is no greater gift you can give a person than life and good quality of life. I'm sure mo most people on the planet would rather have that than a tank. How do you see our foreign policy interacting with our science policy today, interacting with DARPA and NASA and these other things in the world we're living and the demands we have today? And as you've told us earlier, we're not going to be able to control health care costs unless we either prevent them or cure them. What can we as citizens do, leaders of philanthropy, leaders of corporations, leaders of institutes, what can we do? to help you as a leader in, in supporting science do? Well, I mean, Mike, I mean, clearly with this panel and um, just the impressive mission of the Milken Institute in trying to solve problems, um, I think you lay out an unequivocal case for making science a priority. And as you and I have, over the last several years, been working together to try and bring members, we have several members of the House and the Senate, both parties here, uh, uh, this week at the uh, Milken Forum. And um, hopefully what the takeaway is, is looking at science as a way to bring us together. I mean, clearly the return on investment is phenomenal, uh, just from a quality of life standpoint, from our war fighters, as Peggy had, had talked about, and how that uh, seeps into her policy making, and um, certainly in the research end. Um, and it's, it's really a question of, um, Science really, it not only is a qualitative piece, it can be, I mean, it is a quantitative discipline, but for Washington, the imperative right now is to solve the overriding issue on the fiscal piece. Because I, think, I don't think you'd get an American that would be in here today and disagree with the potential success of our country given what we've done. And the future is limitless. We just have to get straight on how we pay for the priority of science. And as we've spoken before, Mike, it's the balance between the federal role um, as the catalyst, undertaking the investment that perhaps the private sector would not take, and for the reasons that you state, whether it's saving lives, finding cures, fighting the enemy. I mean, you know, listen, the uh, Arab our war experience has also shown a, pre, a bent towards now precision weaponry uh, and the ability to avoid loss of life and to affect a foreign policy mission. So I, I don't think there's any question that these investments have made it, all of us better in whatever discipline you look at. And so I'm, I, I'm interested, in, and Peggy mentioned the ecosystem. You know, if we can all sort of focus on the ecosystem because the ecosystem for innovation is what has made America a leader. And you couple that with our commitment at the federal level to fund science uh, in, in the health arena. The reason I believe we are such a world leader on bioscience is because, yes, the NIH funding has been there over the years. We've also went and committed large amounts of dollars uh, to graduate medical education, which has now produced all the specialists in the world. Why is it that people training in medicine want to be here in the United States? It is because of that commitment. These specialists then turn over and produce the innovation 
that then all marry up into some of these successes. So it is a commitment, I think, if you ask what folks can do, is to help us come together on this issue, but in the larger sense, realize that just as you run your businesses, you run your funds, you run your household, we've got to get our arms around setting priorities and the fact that we're going to have to learn um, to become more efficient at the federal level. Eric, I'd like to give a quote here from, that you gave recently, this month. Mapping the human brain is exactly the type of research we should be funding. It's great science. It sounds bipartisan. Because the president <laughs> came out with uh, the initiative right around his State of the Union address, um, I was outspoken and said this is exactly the kind of thing that has the potential for ROI off the charts. We ought to all get behind this. Uh, and, you know, the dirty little secret is we can all be for that, but what is it that we're going to take care of and uh, achieve uh, sort of the funding mechanism for that? That's the challenge. If we step back just for one moment and look at what the NIH has accomplished in job creation and funding, 432,000 new jobs. <coughs> 62 billion in new economic activity, 500 patent applications, support of 300,000 scientists and researchers. And this is an international conference. We have people from 50 to 60 countries here, and we applaud the work being done. I think the challenge is that we can move faster if the U.S. continues its commitment. It is now estimated that 70% of all the scientists in the world in the next decade will be in Asia. It's inevitable the expansion and increase. But what role the United States will play is very important in many ways as a moral center for the world and responsibilities that it plays. And so this is the challenge and the speed that science will move at is greatly related. I want to touch on another area and Majority Leader Kanner you know, as to how we can help you and others wanting to support science today. One of the other areas we focused on at the celebration of science were the disease-specific organizations, the enormous growth of these and efficiencies of these organizations. Whether it be the Melanoma Research Alliance that in the last five years more work has been done and progress has been done in the previous 30 or 40, and the first immunology treatment is for melanoma. The change in cystic fibrosis and other life-threatening and life-ending diseases as a percentage of those patients now can lead normal lives. And the Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation really recently announced a joint venture where it is going to fund $60 million, $59 million for Pfizer to reopen and look at these studies. Now that we can sequence the genome in hours and for thousands, we can now figure out who are those four to five percent in all those failed clinical trials that can go back to the FDA and say, you know, they work with people with this mutation. Now you can know that it's going to work for you before you take it. And this is the verge that we're on. I want to come back to you again. Uh, speaker, what can we, Majority Leader Cannon, what can we do, whether we want to mobilize disease-specific organizations? I assure you we could have millions of people in Washington. In 98, we brought a half a million people to Washington and around the country. Last year, we decided with the budget issues that we would be efficient and just bring 1,000 <laughs> and hopefully the voices of 1,000, but what could we do? to focus not only yours, but everyone's attention on the science, not just for the troops returning, but for those people that have lost their limbs, unfortunately, in Boston today, to maintain NASA, to maintain DARPA. The FDA funding from the federal government is one-tenth of one percent on the consumer products sold and monitored in this country. Boy, we would love to have the California state income tax, instead of being 13 to 14 percent, to be one-tenth. 
of 1%, I'm sure. But how can we help you and others? What, what do we need to do? <laughs> Let me follow up on uh, your suggestion that perhaps motivate and uh, start all the disease-specific groups coming to the halls of Congress. <laughs> uh, I, I can assure you they're already there, as you know. Um, I, I do think, though, that that tends to take away a little bit from the potential that we've got. Because if we can all rally around science, um, certainly there are agencies, the heads who are here uh, in this room, who are much better at deciding allocation of, resor of research dollars than politicians on Capitol Hill. And if we can all rally around, as you did, with the celebration of science in Washington, that phenomenal event, uh, and the direction of this conference, dedicated towards advancement in science, you know, we, we have to just maintain that commitment. Um, you know, I also think this. It, we can apply quantitative solutions uh, to a lot of what's plaguing what I like to call the sort of dinosaur aspect of Washington. You know, there are agencies that are just by virtue of natural forces have sort of atrophied over the last several decades, if not half a century, that we've got to shake and decide what kind of new technology, new analytical tools we can give to them so they can be more efficient, and if they can't do that, Let's shut them down and create a new agency or pay off the debt. Th this, is the, this is the sort of analysis that we need to go about undertaking and to get better. And I think science and the analytical tools that our resor researchers are now applying can really help turn around the direction and the atrophy in Washington. We need to get over that hump while maintaining the view of the future, which is all about science. Well, Majority Leader Kanner, you and Senator Reid and others were instrumental in really doing that, in that the formation of the National Center for Advancing Translational Research and its first director, Dr. Chris Austin, is with us, really was revenue and cost neutral. Other older programs were shut down that were not relevant today in the 21st century, and a new one was born without an increase <coughs> in cost. And we've got a bill that we're bringing to the floor in the next couple weeks called the Kids First Research Act. Uh, I was talking to Francis Collins about this last night. Uh, the Kids First Research Act takes monies. Uh, it is funded by monies that we are currently using to fund political campaigns and conventions, federal dollars. Now, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? We, we want to go and help uh, researchers uh, find cures for things like the neurological diseases, for autism, for other things. Uh, but again, we said we want to do it in the pediatric area. We don't want Washington and, and politicians on Capitol Hill deciding on which disease is more worthy. We want our scientists to do that. Can I just add, um, because I think it's, it's so important and it's something where uh, I feel Congress has done enormously positive work and in a bipartisan way. Sometimes it's not just money, it's also having the authorities and the tools to do what's necessary so that government can be a support um, and a catalyst and, and, and not a hindrance um, or uh, a sort of uh, just deadly bureaucracy. And you know, we recently worked with Congress and with industry and other stakeholders to put together an uh, important piece of legislation that passed last year nearly unanimously. It was a totally bipartisan effort, um, the um, FDA Safety and Innovation Act. And not only did it enable us to access um, additional resources from industry to help support critical programs and goals within the FDA, it also gave us some of the new tools that we need um, to be more effective and efficient in our regulatory pathways. It created a new regulatory program called Breakthrough that, that really gives us the focus and the mandate to when there's a really exciting um, breakthrough discovery in science to, to target our resources and our people in a way that really will help move it quickly through the process in the kind of way we were hearing about with respect to that medical device, but in the, the drug area. It also gave us new authority to work internationally 
um, in critical ways to help support uh, safety and information sharing that enhances our ability to do our job. And it's also focused on critical aspects of regulatory science so that we can develop the critical new tools that we need uh, to be a smarter um, and more 21st regulator, the tools to really be able to identify and qualify uh, genetic and biomarkers um, to speed um, the time of, of the clinical studies necessary to approve a new drug, the predictive toxicology so that if something's going to fail, it will fail early and, and uh, government and industry won't make a lot of investments in a product that's never going to make it over the finish line, innovative new clinical trial designs so they can be shorter and, and um, involve less patients and cheaper as well. So, and using information technology and data mining in new ways to get important answers from existing data and from, from new data. So, so it's really exciting and it's, so it's partly, you know, we need the resources dollar-wise, we need the, the tools and the authorities to be more effective and efficient and to, 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 to really uh, create some of the partnerships and we need the support to develop new models and new ways of doing business. Well, I think that sets the stage, Dr. Hamburg, for us to conclude here with quick, with quick remarks. This panel is titled, The Promise of the Bioscience Century. Today, we've seen just a brief look. But Jeff, I'd like you to start us off. If we were sitting here 10 years from now, how will the world be different because of the contributions of bioscience, DARPA, et cetera? Well, uh, I'd like to restate that. I think that the world is going to be the same in one respect, and that is it's going to stay bold. The one thing that America has and always will have is a bold vision. And the bold vision is because this is a country of innovators, uh, and if you allow people with uh, the innovators with bold visions to give them the resources, they will do great things. If I, I'm just going to share with you just one moment. So when I was in Iraq, um, I was on duty in the emergency department at, um, I was running the ICU, but I was called on the emergency department to see this young fellow. He was a young American, blown out of the cupola of his uh, Humvee on patrol in East Baghdad, broke his back. He came into the, uh, came into the, uh, um, uh, the triage area, and I was called down to see him because I'm a neurologist. And I went down to see him, and um, he was moving his legs and his arms, and everything was fine. So I said to him, I said, uh, you know, son, I said, you've got a, a broken back, uh, but you will heal from this. Um, but... Uh, you're neurologically intact. You look, you're fine. You have a million dollar wound. You're going to go home and you'll fully recover. And you know what that young soldier did? He grabbed my, my jacket and he started to cry. He cried like a baby. I said, why are you crying? He said, you're one of America's heroes. You will get a Purple Heart. You will go home with honor. He said, that's not it. That's not it at all. He said, do you know who I am when I go home? I said, no, what are you? And he said, I'm a manager, assistant manager at a fast food restaurant. But here, I get to help the Iraqi people build a nation of their own. And it just stunned me. But what it said was that he is you and you are he. If I, you were sent to Iraq to do this job, why would you do it? Why would you do it? You would do it because you want to do good. In the end, you want to do something good. You want to have, you want to contribute in a meaningful way, just like this young man did. And so, he is a reflection of you and your children, and the nice thing is you are a reflection of him. But that's what America is. That is exactly what America is. So when we send our troops to war, they don't go to pillage and rape. They go to do exactly what this young man did, just like they did in World War II, just like they did in World War I, and we can go back and back and back. That's what our scientists do. All the things we speak of are things that will make the world better, not just America, the world better, because that's what we do. So in the end, 10 years from now, I will say that we will be exactly what we are today. And 100 years from now, we'll be exactly what we are today. And why do we need to main leader, maintain leadership? Because our people think that way. Maybe others do, I can't speak for them. But I do know our fellow Americans, our regular kid who's an assistant manager at McDonald's, although he is not a scientist, he thinks what we do, he thinks boldly, and he wants to do something that's good for the entire world. And that's why we must stay exactly the way we are today. Wow. Thank you very much.
I think that summarized our panel and this very unusual right. and phenomenal experiment. The U.S. is no longer the sun. It is Jupiter. It is part of this activity. Those two young doctors that discovered that ulcers didn't come from aggravation, but bacteria, who were first challenged, were in Australia, eventually won Nobel Prizes and affected everyone on the planet. The world is changing, but it's that spirit, that immigrant spirit, that we need to maintain, and we want to thank all of you for your commitment and what you do and wish you well, particularly Commissioner Hamburg and Majority Leader Cantor, we are depending on you. Thank you very much.